to Mill Creek Baptist. It's good to see all of you. We have a beautiful, beautiful Independence Day weekend. Um, the weather's cooperating. There's lots of activities. There's a lot of things for us to do this, this weekend as we celebrate the birth of our nation. Yes, Dave. I just have one little short announcement. It doesn't get much attention to it. Ball game is on July the 22nd. I need to know a week before, I think it's going to be like the 15th, who all's going so I can get on the reservation. Okay, they were saying if you're going to go to the ball game, it's July 20, what? Second. 22nd. You need to let him know so that he can get the reservations put in. I'm going. I think it might be fun. I missed the last one. I have an, an, an announcement also I'd like to meet just briefly um, after church with the outreach committee. Uh, we'll just meet up here. It won't take very long. Um, Darla, you have an, an announcement. Yes. Uh, in the bulletin, be sure to read Avon Retiring from our custodial position. And we thank you very much. Okay, for those of you that may have not heard, um, the trustees are looking for a custodian for the church. Uh, they would like to reach out to our church family and their family members uh, to fill that position. If you know of someone, uh, please contact Darla or any of the other trustees and let them know by July 15th. Um, and then uh, if no one has responded, they have, will have to start seeking for uh, outside of the church for someone to fill that position. Um, Dave Pawn Dave is retiring. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, if you know somebody that needs a job, um, bring their name up. Okay. Let's stand for the pledges. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Its words will I hide in my heart, that I might not sin against God. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag, and to the Savior for the kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can you join me, please, as we sing, um, All Creatures of Our God and King, it is on page 63 in your hymnal.
praise the Lord. Larry and I on Thursday, I think it's Thursday the 8th, we'll be married 50 years. And uh, <laughs> of course, because I'm sure he's carried us through more than what I can even identify. <laughs> he's been good to us. And I wanted to thank my daughter in laws I had to laugh at the little girls when I picked them up this morning. First thing when they got in the car, they said, we went out for family dinner last night. And the first thing they said, Grandma, we want you to know, my dad and my uncles did not plan that. That was my mom and Aunt Julie. <laughs> so they got rad about this morning. But we had a wonderful time, and I'm thankful. We should always be um, okay with just jumping in, just standing up and making the word of proclamation. That, that's fine. Um, I trust that you are well this week. Um, I, I uh, shared with uh, First Baptist Church this morning how grateful I am for them to be flexible enough um, uh, with their services, and I certainly I'm grateful for each of you for being flexible enough for me to be able to spend first part of my morning. I, I joke with them that I spent first service over there. And if you want to hear the perfected sermon, you just got to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> get all my good thoughts when I'm preaching there. So, uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, I trust that you are well, and I thank you for all of your generosity today. So, um, in allowing us to have that relationship. But let us go before the Lord. Um, the psalmist tells us, he invites us in, come and see what the Lord has done. We're a little hot this morning. Come and see what the Lord has done for us. Um, let us be invited in to come and see what his hand is doing around us. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful Father, we come before you this morning. And we thank you for all of the things that your hand has created, all of the things that you have given to us, the ways that we feel comfortable expressing and the ways that are hidden deep within our hearts. Lord, thank you for what you have done and what you will do in our lives. Lord, you've heard the voices of your servants this morning, giving thanks and praise for all the ways that you have walked with them this week, walked with their loved ones in surgeries, walked answering prayers, giving healing, lifting and restoring those that they care about. Lord, we know it is your hand at work, and we pray that it would continue to be at work this week. Lord, we ask that you would be present this morning we invite your spirit into our presence. That you might be with us, that you might work in us, that you might mold us and make us. That, Lord, each and every day, each and every moment of our lives, we may say, we praise you, O oh God, for the things you have done and the things that you will do. Lord, there's so many things in our hearts this morning. So many concerns. People that we love that are hurting today. I pray that you might just hear them. That you might see them. That you might know them. And that we might be a presence in their lives. Not just through prayer. But to be a physical presence. To walk with them. To help them carry their burden. Lord, we pray for um, Dan and Eileen as they prepare to travel. I pray that you would lift them up in their grief today. I pray that you might keep them safe on the road, as well as all the others that are gathering. I pray for the family that they may grieve the loss of this stepmother well. They may grieve the loss of this wife. Well, 
all because your face is turned towards them and are shining upon them. Lord, I pray for those facing surgery. I ask that if their hearts are unsettled, if they're uncertain, Lord, that you would bring certainty into their life. That you would already begin to bring healing into their presence and into their bodies. Lord, I pray for our communities. I pray that your spirit might go into the lives of those around us and might warm their hearts that we might encounter each other and that you might be the center of that encounter. And because of that, their lives would be changed. That our communities would be different. Lord, I pray today for Mill Creek that we would be a people who say even in times where we do not know what comes next, that we would choose to be your presence in this community and the lives of those around us. That they might see your face. That they might understand what it means to be restored by you. That they might hear the words, come to the table. Come and see what the Lord has done. That we might give praise together. Lord, we pray for our world which is broken and divided. It's been that way for some time. But there are moments in our lives where conflict takes a different face. And so we pray for places like Ukraine and Myanmar today, Lord. That you might be a presence of peace in those places. That you might see those innocent lives that are being confronted in these wars. People who feel they have no power, no sway, no ability to stop what's going on, but yet suffer the consequences and suffer them immensely. Lord, may your peace descend upon those places and may you see those people today and may you call them to be your own. Lord, help us to be people of peace. Help us to bear forth the fruit that you call us to bear out in our world and in our lives. And Lord, when we fail, I pray that you might forgive us, that you might continue to see us through your mercy, your grace, your love, and your forgiveness. That we might be lifted up, that we might be restored, and that the world may know the extent of your love. Lord, today we give our lives to be your people, asking that you would be our God. In your precious and holy name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us stand and give thanks if you are able through the words of the doxology. Praise God from
from the 66th chapter of Isaiah. You astute scholars will know that's the last chapter. It's the end of the book. Let us hear the words from Isaiah. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her. All you who love her, rejoice greatly with her. All you who mourn over her. For you will nurse and be satisfied. You will drink deeply and delight in her overflowing abundance. For this is what the Lord says. I will extend peace to her like a river, and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. You will nurse and be carried in her arm, and dandled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart will rejoice, and you will flourish like grass, and the hand of the Lord will be known to his servants. But his fury will be shown to his foes. For you see, the Lord is coming with fire. His chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down in his anger with fury and rebuke with flames of fire. For the fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment upon all men. And many will be those slain by the Lord. And may I add, thanks be to God that he uses the sword of mercy on all of those that call upon his name. Would you stand with me, please, as we say to God be the glory that is on page 56 in your name. Thank you. 
All because of what Jesus had done to fulfill, to fulfill that law which was given, which was a deposit just awaiting for the time for Jesus to come. We celebrate that today. But I bet like the church at Galatia, we sometimes are divided too. We have our issues. Now the issue then was the Jewish Christians again were pressuring and questioning whether those that were not keeping the law as it was given through Moses and whether they were believers or not. And we get to the end of the church book of Galatians and in some ways we get we're starting in the wrong place because Paul has made a case before them of what has been fulfilled and now he urges them to live a life by the Spirit. The Spirit that is the presence of Jesus and Jesus who is the presence of God. And he urges them, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should remember should restore them, Jeff. But beware yourself, for you may also be tempted. I urge you to carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law that was given through Christ Jesus our Lord. If any of you thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives you. Each one of you should test your own actions. Each one testing his own actions, then you can take pride in yourself without comparing yourself to somebody else. For each one should carry their own load. And anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with their instructor. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word from the book of the nations. A church that wasn't getting along. A church that was divided. Paul very simply states that the purpose of the gospel, the purpose of our lives in the Spirit, are to bear out the fruit that the Spirit brings. Just a few short verses earlier, he defines what those are. They are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he reminds us that against those things, if you live that way, there is no law. There's no law that can nullify it. There's no law that can make it great. There is no law. The law doesn't stand up if you choose to be this kind of person and bear that fruit. But they, like us, live in a world where people oftentimes are divided. They, live in, they lived in a world where even believers who sit in the same pews, or at least somewhere near each other in the pews, can be divided. They can get caught up in this pattern of forgetting that Jesus had come to unify us, to bring us together. And he did that by leaving his spirit. And our purpose is to bear out that fruit. John often would write about that fruit as the fruit of love. John in 1 John would tell us that nobody has seen God. But we know God by his love. And for those who know God, or proclaim to know God, they will act in love. And love, for Paul, are the fruits of the Spirit. And so in chapter 6, he gives us some very practical advice. And in short, it goes this way. You brothers and sisters are tempted to look across the aisle, you're tempted to get up, turn your head, and you're tempted to look and say, Lord, thanks be to God, I am not a sinner. 
sinful as Sister Shirley. Thank you that I'm better than Brother Dave. He says, do not get caught up. But your purpose, if the Spirit dwells in you, and you proclaim this Jesus whose body was broken, whose, spirit, whose blood was spilled, and by doing that has forgiven you once and for all, has fulfilled what the law was incapable of doing. If you cry out to the God who sent Jesus, and to the Jesus who sent the Spirit, and you're bearing the fruit out, you will not get caught up in it. Instead, what you will do is what the table represents today, which is to look out and to lift other people up, to restore them. And Paul says, so if you find somebody in your life if you find a brother or sister and they have stumbled, I don't ask you to judge them. I ask you to lift them up. I don't ask you to condemn them. I ask you to restore them. Our attitude, when the fruits of the Spirit are working well, our attitude is one of restoring someone, not heaping shame and guilt upon them. And that's what was happening in the church at Galatia. And it so often can be what happens to us. That we look across the aisle and we get caught up in this, well, at least I'm not as bad as the one who As if your sin is any less potent than someone else. We certainly do have societal sins that are far more egregious than others. The truth be told, in the eyes of God, all sin is equal. But thanks be to God, as Paul says, we have received freedom because of the presence of the Spirit and because of the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. We have received freedom from God because of His great mercy. His immense forgiveness. His overpowering grace in our lives. It'd be a good exercise for us to write down all the things that we are in Jesus Christ. All the things that we believe we are in this world. Even those things that how the world defines us. Even those things that we define ourselves by. And then put on the other half of paper. But it's not, it is nothing in comparison to the mercy and grace that God the Father has for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And by the power of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit. That's the meaning of what Paul wants them to live when he urges them to live by the Spirit. And he says, when you are tempted to look at your neighbor, when you are tempted to look at those sitting across from you in the church and hold them to a different standard, remember, Jesus Christ held you to one standard and one standard alone. And that was the mercy, the grace, and the forgiveness that is offered by the Father. What Jesus did and this table represents is to say you are no longer defined by your failures and your brokenness. And boy, isn't the church filled with people who are broken and have failed. There's power in recognizing that. And Paul says, if you have this temptation to, for Sister Betty to look at Sister Janet and say, oh, that amount, that's her. God says, look at yourself. And ask yourself, was my mercy and my grace good enough for you? Was it enough? And Paul says that if that's not enough, he gives us 
a very, very practical thing to do as we live together. And he says, exercise this, carry one another. far different if Sister Betty looked at Sister Janet and said, Sister Janet, I see you struggling. Let me carry you. It's a far different attitude. It bears a whole different set of fruit in our lives when we as people are honest about, as I sometimes sarcastically would say, our own hypocrisy. to look at each other and say, I see you struggling. But I don't want I don't want you to break. I don't want you to be held down by the, the guilt and the shame. I want you to be restored. And Paul says, you want to restore people? Walk with them. You want to help restore people as the fruit, uh, as the spirit and as Jesus did? Carry your burdens with them. Consider what someone else in your life is struggling with to be something you struggle with. But be careful. This exercise is not that you might become weighted down and get caught up in the same thing. The purpose of it is that what Jesus had done is remove the weight. He didn't remove the burden. He doesn't always remove the burden. He doesn't always take away the storm. He doesn't always take away the troubling circumstances, but he does promise to relieve the weight. And the way Jesus does it is he walks with us. And he asks us to do the same. Because Paul knew what John knew. No one has ever seen God face to face. Well, there are a few. But they were transformed. They were different. But John says, we have not seen God. But we know him. Because those who take on the call to be Jesus in their communities, in the lives of people that they come in contact with, those that choose to bear out the fruits of the Spirit, they will know what God is about. And what God is about is lifting people up, restoring them. So often we can get uh, caught up in the prideful game of judging people. Of looking and saying, if you would only do this. If you'd only stop doing this. And certainly those things are important, but Paul says, don't ever tell someone to do those things unless you're willing to walk with them, beside them, as they struggle to be transformed. I think sometimes in our world, the brokenness and the division is really about us choosing not to walk with people around us, to be a presence in their lives, to help carry their burdens, to help show them a way that is different. There are so many people in our world that feel like they are being judged. By the government, by people in their lives, by family members. And the church has this call to look upon them and say there is a different way. Come. And let us walk together and let us carry the burden together because it's difficult. But there is a warning.
don't get caught up in whatever you're doing. Paul was giving this call to the spiritually strong. Paul was giving this word to people who he knew were capable of carrying people's burdens and helping them without being drawn down into the, the chaos and the mess. And the only way to do that is for us to constantly give ourselves to the presence of the Spirit in our lives and say, protect me. Keep me safe. Let us choose to be people who say we want people to know Jesus as one that has come, not to tell them what they're doing wrong, but for Jesus to tell them there's a different way. And though your, your burden is heavy, let me carry it with you so that it will be light. I know your storms are difficult, but let me be a presence in the midst of it. And Paul says the way that that happens is through those who profess to call upon his name. To live by the Spirit. To look at their own lives and say, oh, I need that. I need someone helping me carry my burdens just as much as I need to help somebody carry theirs. Sometimes I think all Jesus did was walk with others in the mess of their lives. You say, come, find salvation. Come and find what it means for your, the weight of your life to not be its table this morning, let us choose to be the people that bear the fruit of the Spirit out. <clears throat> but to do it by walking with others. <laughs> to say, I serve a Lord that has restored me. I'm not perfect. I'm not fully restored. I don't have it all together. But I know one who is walking with me. And I want him to walk with you too. Sometimes what the invitation to the table needs is for us to come and walk with others and say, let's go eat. Let's break bread together. <laughs> if you're scared, you're intimidated, come to the table because you feel like your life, uh, your life is not worthy? Well, my life's not worthy of your life. I'm just as broken and shattered. Boy, I wish I looked as good as Sister Benny or something. I wish I looked put together. But you know, sometimes we we like to look put together, don't we? Let's tell the world that we're broken too. But let's come to the table. He's prepared for us. The bread of forgiveness and the wine that tells us. I have come to give life and to give it life. Gracious and merciful Father, we bow our lives before you today. As we look to come to the table, we confess to you that our lives are not always us. Lord, we confess that we do not always choose the way of the kingdom. 
We don't know, we don't choose often enough to love, to be gentle. So Lord, we need your breath to breathe on us. Fill us with life in you. In order that we may love as you love. That we can do what you Help us to walk with others as we invite them to come and see what you will do. To come and see what you will do for all of those who seek after life. To come and say we do not need to come as perfect people. But we only need to come to seek the Savior who has lifted us up. Help us to be your people and your precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. We do seek to come to the table. We'll have a hymn of response. But let me urge you, just as we were urged earlier, for God to have grace. Just let that be our For God to have grace upon the world around us. That we may be people that struggle to understand what it means to say, breathe on me, of God. Fill me with life in me. That I may love as thou dost love. And do as thou dost. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn. Number 389, Spirit of the Living God, as we seek the God.
the table has been set. And we're called to just come and partake with two simple requirements, that we believe in our hearts, that God raised Jesus from the dead, because we've confessed with our lips that Christ Jesus is our Lord. We don't have to be without storms. We don't have to be perfect. But we do have to be willing to be perfected by the mercy and grace of God and His presence in our lives. To be willing to be. The table is set for everyone. But if that confession of confessing with our lips and believing in our heart has not been made, we urge you, make that today before you come to the table. If you need to recommit to that, do that, and then come to the table. There is no shame in recommitting or committing our lives as broken vessels looking to be repaired. For he sat at a table that night with a whole lot of people that didn't understand with a whole lot of people whose lives were messed up. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And he prayed, saying, blessed art thou, Lord God, King of the universe, the giver of the manna from heaven. And in like manner, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, the cup that will invite you to live according to the fruits of the Spirit. Blessed art thou, art thou, Lord God, King of the universe, the giver of the fruit of the vine that restores those who seek it. Come and behold, come and celebrate.
with Jimmy, would you lead us in the Lord's Prayer today? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.